The best time to ever once. No, New York, there, right? Yeah. yeah. They had quite a, quite a bunch of name bands there, too. That was the same year you were in Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Boys over there. Yeah, I saw him someplace around here. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the uh, traditional Stowe Veterans Day breakfast. I'm glad that everybody could make it. And uh, we do think uh, that you'll find the program worthwhile and, and enjoyable. So to uh, start things off, I'd like to uh, uh, ask the Reverend Dr. Cynthia uh, Landrum to um, start with the uh, opening uh, reading and, and uh, words. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be here with you today. It is an honor. Spirit of life, we are filled with gratitude today. Gratitude for those who prepared food for our table and the gracious help of these BSA scouts. Gratitude for the liberty, peace, and security we share, and grateful most of all for the service of the veterans we honor today. These servicemen and women who gave their time, their talent, and their dedication to our country. Today we pray with hopes for safety, security, and peace and well-being for all those who are currently serving our country in military service, both at home and abroad. May they experience peace. May they be safe and well. And we pray for our leaders in the service and our elected officials who set the policies and make the hard calls. May they set the course wisely. May they be filled with good judgment. May they have compassion and love. And we pray for the citizens of this land. Today we set aside this day to honor your service. May we be filled with, with gratitude and respect for that service. And again, to those who served, with deep respect, we honor you. Your dedication and your service to our highest ideals brings us the values of freedom, justice, and equity, and the peace that we enjoy. Thank you. Amen, and blessed be. Welcome to the Stowe Veterans Day Breakfast. My name is Howard Kendall, and I'm a member of the Rotary Club of Neshoba Valley, which serves the towns of Stowe, Bolton, and Lancaster. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, an armistice, or a temporary cessation of hostilities in that great and terrible war, was declared between the Allied nations and Germany. Commemorated as Armistice Day beginning the following year, November 11th, became a legal federal holiday in the United States in 1938. Today we celebrate the 101st anniversary of World War I, the war that people at that time called the war to end all wars, if only that were true. In the aftermath of World War II and the Korean War, Armistice Day became Veterans Day, a holiday <coughs> dedicated to American veterans of all wars, including our more recent wars in Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, as well as elsewhere where democracy needed protecting. On a personal note, I am a Vietnam era U.S. Army veteran, trained as an artillery fire direction controller, but ultimately assigned to G1 personnel to utilize the skills of my civilian education. 
when we say era veteran, that means we were trained to go to war, uh, but we weren't sent there. Um, but we were willing to. Unlike my cousin and millions of others, I did not serve in combat. I honor and respect every veteran of every war who put their life on the line for our country in a combat role. Even if not a veteran yourself, almost everyone has a relative or loved one who has served in the armed forces. We thank you for your support of the men and women who have served to ensure our security and our peace. Now, we'll begin today's program with a flag ceremony, Pledge of Allegiance, and responsive reading of Remember Them, which is in the back of your program. So, if the scouts would like to take over, much appreciated. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. You're forgiven. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join me in the responsive reading on the back of your uh, pamphlets. We remember them. We remember with sorrow those whom death has taken from our midst. Taking those dear ones into our hearts with all of our beloved, we recall them now with reverence. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we remember them. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember them. In the opening of buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember them. In the blueness of the sky and in the warmth of summer, we remember them. In the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we remember that. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember that. When we are weary and in need of their strength, we remember that. When we are lost and are sick at heart, we remember that. When we have joys we yearn to share, we remember that. So as long as we live, they too shall live, for they are now a part of us. So at this time, we would like to acknowledge many people who have made this possible. Our sincere appreciation and thanks goes out to, and we'll start out with the two quarterbacks, and they have been for many, many years of this event. Uh, that is Laura and Chris Spear from the Rotary Club of Neshoba Valley. Uh, Thank you, Laura and Chris. Where's Chris? Uh, we've received financial support from a number of organizations uh, for our event today. Uh, the Stowe Friends on the Council on Aging, uh, the Ro Rotary Club in Neshoba Valley, and Dunkin' Donuts uh, for the coffee. TD Bank and Keller Williams for the decorations. Are all our cooks out so they can be acknowledged? Uh, we want to acknowledge our cooks who are here bright and early. I can uh, tell you at 6 o'clock or maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, Laura Spear, Dana Gray, Terry Hanato, Dan Hanato, Lisa Lavina, Mary Garcia, and Marsha Rising. And I do believe that uh, Rich Garcia helped as well. So thank you all. Uh, others to be considered in our appreciation, uh, members of the Rotary Club in Neshoba Valley who have done many, many things behind the scenes for this. Uh, Nancy McPherson of Nancy's at the Airfield Cafe for help with the food that we've enjoyed this morning. Certainly, the Boy Scout Troop number one, in addition to our flag ceremony, uh, they have set up, have helped serve, 
clean, they'll be cleaning up, <laughs> and uh, of course, led in the plague ceremonies. Uh, students from the Interact Club of Neshoba Regional High School uh, for their assistance. Uh, additionally, uh, Stowe, additionally, Stowe TV for filming this event uh, so that many others can share in it even if they couldn't make it here this morning. Phil Mosley for the help with the uh, First Parish uh, Church sound system, which is working very nicely, I hope. I hope everybody can hear. Uh, okay, sorry. It's given the wrong name. Uh, the Stowe Board of Selectmen, who work diligently for our town day in and day out. And our thanks also go out to the many other uh, Stowe officials who work on behalf of this town. And our thanks lastly go to Jackie Foster and Lisa Trainer, who, who have provided decorations for the table. And many, many thanks to any volunteers I did miss uh, inadvertently. So what we'd like to do now is to acknowledge all of the veterans who are here. When you hear your branch of service called out, if you could kindly uh, stand and um, members of all branches will be, sta will be standing together. So in alphabetical order, we certainly don't want to do it any other way. <laughs> Don't want to get into any Army-Navy conflicts before the, the game after Thanksgiving, do we? Uh, so the Air Force and Air Force Reserve. The Air National Guard. Army and Army Reserve. Army National Guard. Coast Guard and Coast Guard Reserve. Marine Corps and Marine Corps Reserve. Navy and Navy Reserve. Thank you to everybody for your service. So it's uh, my, my great pleasure and honor at this point uh, to introduce uh, our state senator, Senator Jamie Eldridge. Uh, Jamie, Senator Eldridge represents Middlesex in Worcester District. He is known for his leadership and independence on behalf of his constituents including standing up against corporate interests, fighting for more transparency in government, and election and campaign fight, uh, finance reform. At the State House, Jamie has focused his energies in the Senate on these critical issues, as well as investing in public education and transportation, stimulating the economy, making health care a right, protecting the environment, and increasing access to the clean energy, criminal justice reform, protecting immigrants, expanding civil rights, passing zoning reform, and creating more affordable housing. I'm not sure what he does in his spare time. <laughs> anyway, if you would please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Senator Eldridge. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to say a few words here at the Stowe Veterans Day Breakfast. And I'm just coming from Acton, where the Acton Boxer Rotary Club put on a breakfast for about uh, 300 uh, veterans and their families from Acton Boxborough. So I want to thank the Rotary Club of Neshoba Valley. I also thank the Boy Scouts and all the volunteers 
uh, for putting together this very special breakfast and always honored to stop by and, and say a few words. Um, I, I just want to say I'm proud to stand here with all of you today and, and reflect on the, the commitment and brave service of veterans, including here in Stowe, and pay tribute uh, to that service and your willingness to sacrifice your lives, uh, to give your time and give your service for our country uh, to protect the freedoms that are so uh, cherished, especially here in Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts is home to approximately 380,000 of the nation's more than 21 million veterans. And I'm very, very proud to say that Massachusetts uh, is known to have the most generous uh, veterans benefits of any other state in the country. And just a few of those uh, benefits including, include uh, free tuition uh, for veterans uh, to any public university, uh, reduction on property taxes, uh, the military bonus for those uh, who most recently have served in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and other overseas ventures, as well as uh, a commitment to provide support in each and every community through our veterans agents. And I really want to thank a uh, veterans agent uh, who serves here in Stowe, um, very, very important service. And one of the things that um, really try to emphasize is what are communities doing to uh, best support our veterans coming home, whether from a military co uh, conflict or serving in our, in our armed forces. And yesterday I had the opportunity in Littleton to attend a rededication, uh, the Edward Romley Veterans Corner. It's at the Littleton Common. I encourage you, if you're driving through Littleton, stop by and see it. This is a rededication of a Veterans Corner that was first established in 1987. And I know Stowe has also recently re rededicated many of its veterans memorials. Uh, but learning a little bit about Edward Romley, who uh, came back from World War II, uh, he served for 29 years at the Veterans Services Officer for the town of Littleton. And one of the things that was emphasized in his biography is his commitment to making sure that every single veteran, uh, when she or he came back to their hometown, that they felt welcomed. And thinking about what, what do we need to do to make sure that all of our veterans are welcomed. Um, it's not just the services that I talked about, it's not just about the state benefits, but how do we make sure uh, that veterans, many who um, are coming back with uh, trauma, with PTSD, are welcome. And, and part of that, of course, is Veterans Day breakfast like this. Part of it is the outreach by veterans services. But also, it's about you know, what are employers doing to making sure that in their workforce there are veterans? Um, what are we doing to make sure that veterans are welcome to run for public office or to serve on public boards? I think oftentimes there's sometimes a, a distancing uh, between veterans and the rest of the community. Um, and it's really so critical for each and every town and city and of course elected officials, whether the state level, the federal, local, about how we can be most welcoming to veterans. So um, one of the things I know that many communities have looked about is veterans housing. Um, how do we make sure that every veteran has a safe, decent place to live? That's something that many of our communities are looking at as well as looking at what the state can do to best support veterans. Um, so it was a really nice ceremony yesterday in Littleton, and um, I just want to sort of finish my comments is that, you know, I think oftentimes at, at Veterans Day breakfast, um, there's a focus on the willingness for veterans to serve their country, uh, but not as much a focus on what our country stands for. And there's a lot of things that our country stands for. I always think back to the Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution, uh, the, the right to say anything we wish, freedom uh, in the First Amendment, uh, the right to criticize um, you know, anyone, whether in government, um, to be able to have that freedom um, that doesn't exist in other countries, the freedom of assembly for us to gather in a place like this, uh, freedom of religion, the right for us to worship you know, any god that we wish. Um, th these are freedoms that make the sacrifices our veterans make um, I think all the more sacred in this country. So I want to thank all the veterans here. Um, it's an honor uh, for me to represent you, uh, to advocate for you, and um, if there's anything that I can do uh, to better support you, please let me know. So thank you so much for having me, and once again, happy Veterans Day.
I'll lower the microphone a little. <laughs> it's now my uh, great honor and privilege to introduce uh, our representative, uh, Representative Kate Hogan. I would like to introduce her. A Stowe resident, Kate represents the 3rd Middlesex District, which consists of the towns of Bolton, Hudson, Maynard, and Stowe. At the State House, Representative Hogan serves as Chair of the Committee on Public Health. Kate is co-chair of the Elder Caucus, a bipartisan committee which works directly with statewide advocates to address senior issues. Well, I'll vote for that one. Notice the gray, ha gray hair. She also serves as chair of the Public Library Caucus, which advocates for our, our local <laughs> public libraries across the state, and I'm sure does many, many other things behind the scenes that we're not aware of uh, working on our behalf. With no further ado, we rep we introduce the, the representative for her comments. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much. You know, it's rather embarrassing to even have our jobs and duties described here today because we are here because of all you veterans and we uh, are so grateful for your service and your willingness to protect our freedoms. Uh, welcome and gratitude to Colonel Arvid Hill who's going to be speaking later. Uh, the Rotary Club of Neshoba Valley, uh, Howard, uh, Chris, uh, and all the other folks that put in uh, a morning's work to make sure that our, honor, our honored guests uh, have a great breakfast. The Boy Scouts, yay, Boy Scouts! Right. <laughs> Students from no non Neshoba Valley Regional High School as well, thank you so much. <laughs> and all of our town, uh, state officials, and public safety folks who I know are out there in the audience. Thank you so much. Um, to all our veterans here, a grateful nation and a proud commonwealth, thank you for your service. And today I would like to talk about our hometown heroes, to say their names and share their stories, uh, like Martha Monroe and Tom Zavorsky and Patty Bolton who bravely serve and served their country and continue to serve their fellow veterans right here in Stowe. Because those are the folks that ensure you and yours are honored and remembered. So thanks and gratitude to them. Or our Stowe nurses over time who brought their skills to the battlefield, joining the American Red Cross to save lives overseas. Or the team of engineers who designed the high-tech robots used in the Iraq war now on display at the Heritage Museum. These are our hometown heroes. These are the stories of heroism that shape this place we call home. November 11th, a day marked in history for its hard-won peace over and over again. But it is about our veterans and the men and women from Stowe called to serve and their bravery on and off the battlefield. In a time of shifting front lines, when high-tech robots join boots on the ground in fractured places across the globe, today a hard-won peace, won over and over, seems elusive. But our soldiers, sailors, Air Force, and Marines are still serving and doing whatever is necessary to keep our country safe. And the Commonwealth's nearly 400,000 veterans who fought for that peace and share in that legacy of heroism are the most diverse in our history. Over the coming decades, the growing percentage of women and minority veterans are expected to increase exponentially. And the landscape itself is evolving for veterans returning home. This generation of veterans encounters many new opportunities, but also profound challenges. On the heels of the post-September 11th GI Bill, Massachusetts veterans pursuing college degrees in record numbers. But a recent study 
also found that post 9-11 veterans are also three times as likely to report experiencing post-traumatic stress than their peers from earlier conflicts. For all our hometown heroes, we must protect this critical pathway to education and opportunity, for they are our future leaders, there is no doubt. For all our hometown heroes, we must advance better understanding about what post-traumatic stress is and how it affects our veterans. Already many of our institutions of higher learning are answering this call by strengthening their outreach to veteran students and working collaboratively to break down barriers to academic success. At Middlesex Community College, for instance, uh, where many Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans have enrolled, in recent years there are now veteran-led resource centers, critically important. But every college campus on which veterans set foot in our Commonwealth must be equipped to support these exceptional students, and I mean exceptional in every possible way. The range of experience they bring to the classroom and the distinct challenges they face. That is why the Mass House of Representatives passed a bill last week to make academic environments at our 29 colleges and universities not just welcoming to veterans, but a place where they are supported in taking a big step towards their future and in their future, our future. As part of the bill, the University of Massachusetts Medical Center will develop a continuing education course to better train higher education counselors working with students with post-traumatic stress. We are here today to thank our veterans, but we are also here for our veterans tomorrow and the day after that. For those who served in the Great War in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so many conflicts. For women and men, young and old, college students and small business owners, heroes are among us. That is who we are. We stand together with our veterans. Today and tomorrow and the day after that, we are called not just to honor our hometown <laughs> heroes, but walk a mile in their shoes. Like the World War II Army issue boots belonging to Antonio, one of my hometown heroes, they're a tough brown suede scuffed in places and tied up with red laces, and we walk together in those shoes towards a brighter tomorrow. God bless the town of Stowe, God bless this great commonwealth, and God bless the USA. Thank you. So at this time, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Colonel Arvid R. Hill, whose speech topic is honor veterans today, but appreciate them always. Colonel Hill is director of plans, operations, and readiness in his traditional National Guard assignment, while also serving full-time as Director of International Affairs. These positions involve strategic planning, organizational assessment, and building partner capability, or capacity rather, with our state's partnership program with the countries of Kenya and Paraguay. Colonel Hill's awards include the Meritorious Service Medal, the Army Commendation Medal, and the Army Achievement Medal. Previous duty assignments include command of the 110th Maintenance Company and Air and command of the 126th Brigade Support Battalion in Springfield, as well as multiple other duty assignments throughout the Commonwealth. Colonel Hill was deployed during the 2003-2004 time frame in support of Operation Iraq Freedom at Tali, Talil Air Base in Iraq. Colonel Hill is a graduate of the United States Army War College, holds two master's degrees, 
and lives with his family in Dudley and had a bit of a drive to get here today. So please welcome him uh, warmly. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to come speak to you today. And uh, I want to thank the Rotary Club of Neshoba Valley. And especially, I want to recognize the Boy Scout Troop 1 of Stowe. Uh, there's a slight edit I'd like to make reference to in my bio. Um, I should have made reference to the fact that I was a star uh, Boy Scout. And that uh, one of my regrets was not completing the Eagle um, and achieving that. So I would encourage you to continue on uh, with the program and achieve that Eagle rank because with that comes a lot of benefits, especially with regards to military academies and service uh, to our great country. So I encourage you to continue driving on with uh, the, the scouts and appreciate each other and motivate each other to do great things. But thank you for being here. I'd also like to make an admin note. I hope he doesn't mind if I call him out. But uh, our highest ranking enlisted soldier uh, is our state command sergeant major. And amongst us this morning is we have a former Massachusetts National Guard state command sergeant major. So I'd like to recognize Sergeant Major Belanger. We were talking a little bit earlier when I first arrived here this morning, and uh, he said, boy, I remember when you were a captain. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, amazing how a career can go and how we, our, our lives intertwine. And I'm also very grateful to be here because of all the veterans in the room. When uh, Howard was calling out every uh, branch of service to stand and be recognized, that was, I should have run my uh, script by you because I wanted to do that too. But uh, I do want to take an opportunity to personally thank you all for your service. And um, when I talk about the theme of appreciating uh, veterans always, uh, this, today we honor our veterans. But in terms of appreciating them always, uh, our representatives talked about um, services that we can provide to take care of our, our veterans. But also, our employers, it's important that the employers watch out for our veterans and those who serve as well. Because one thing that we've noticed uh, recently, over the last several years, is that um, we have people who are in the National Guard trying to find jobs, but then when the employer finds out they're in the National Guard, now they don't break the law, but they certainly uh, look to try to hire someone who they can count on all the time. And with our National Guard experience, uh, we, we have drill weekends and we have a couple of weeks uh, training during the summer, usually. Uh, and then we have the occasional school and we have the occasional deployment. Uh, but one thing that I think it's important for all of us to recognize is that these are the types of uh, people that are very beneficial to any type of business. And those uh, short-term hardships of having them be away for training or serving our country is going to pay off dividends in the long run. So I would encourage everyone to, especially if you have friends who run a business or are looking for uh, employees, that we recognize that these are probably the best or amongst the best of our society. And uh, we want to take advantage and appreciate them and give them those opportunities to get those jobs so that all of our National Guard force um, can provide for their families and, uh, and aren't looking for work. So that was a few bit of add-ons based on the, the crowd that I could, was able to uh, glean this morning. So now I'll go right into my formal presentation. And I should, probably should have fixed this earlier. Feels like it's right in my face. <laughs> uh, so it is my sincere honor and privilege to address you this morning as a member of the Massachusetts National Guard. My theme this morning is honor veterans today, but appreciate them always. Veterans Day annually falls on November 11th. This day is the anniversary of the signing of the armistice, as Howard had uh, alluded to this morning, which ended the World War I hostilities between the 
Allied Nations and Germany in 1918. We thank veterans today for their services to the United States. Veterans Day is a day of tribute which I'll take a step further. Veterans and those who serve our nation and community deserve constant appreciation. This is my belief because they are our citizens willing to answer the call to duty, to support and defend our values, freedom, and way of life. In every generation, you or someone you know has answered the call to service of the armed forces. This service and patriotism are the definitive examples of their character. When they speak of the United States of America and what this country means to them, they stand tall and their eyes turn misty in remembrance of the brothers and sisters in arms whom they proudly call family. The individuals we honor today are United States veterans. While front lines have changed from the European and Pacific theaters in World War II, the Korean Peninsula, the jungles of Vietnam, to the deserts of the Middle East, and evolved with digital and political fashions, the National Guard has remained steady and ready, and always there. The sacrifices of our National Guard veterans represent the foundation of our country, from the original Minuteman to our modern warriors who will give their lives to protect life, liberty, and property. In the words of President John F. Kennedy, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. Members of the Air and Army National Guard may be your neighbors, your teachers, your public servants, employees, supervisors, business owners, but the moment they don the uniform, they are airmen and soldiers who defend the homeland and respond at a moment's notice. I'm gonna share a story this morning about, from a National Guard perspective, of our dual purpose. We are training and prepared to respond to the call uh, overseas, but we also uh, are trained and prepared to respond to emergencies here in Massachusetts. Additionally, the training that we receive uh, serves uh, a dual purpose of also being able to uh, respond to individual crises, which I'm going to address with this story this morning. When Specialist Richard Cabarrus left home on the evening of June 4th, 2005, he had no idea that before he returned home, the training he had received in the Massachusetts Army National Guard would be put to good use. Traveling on one, Route 195 in Dartmouth, Mass, Cabarrus came upon a disabled motor vehicle that had been involved in a minor accident. While the vehicle's driver and passenger were inspecting the damage, an oncoming vehicle, unable to see the disabled vehicle in the dark, hit the vehicle from behind. Upon impact, the driver and passenger were pinned between the disabled car and the guardrail. By the time Cabarrus arrived at the scene, many more vehicles were involved. Risking his own safety, Cabarrus made his way through the vehicular pileup toward the uh, two injured men. He said, I walked up to the victims and said, I know this is going to sound crazy, but what but I know what to do, and I can help you. There was another guy there who knows me and who told the victims, it's okay, he's in the military. That is a great example of the trust that our society has in those uh, individuals who serve and uh, the trust that they have in our ability to help. Recognizing that the two men had serious injur injuries to their legs and that one was going into shock, Cabarrus began using skills that he had been taught to him at his National Guard unit, headquarters battery of the 101st Field Artillery, during common task training. In this situation, Cabarrus knew he could draw upon his training that he had gained from the combat lifesaver instructor in his unit. One guy was lying on the ground and he was really pale. I saw that his leg was severely injured and that he was trying to move it around. I touched his face, his skin was cold and clammy, and I knew he was about to go into shock. 
Fabaris recalls, I used his good knee as a prop for his injured leg, which was not only elevated, oh, I'm sorry, which not only elevated his injured leg to help prevent shock, but also helped to prevent the man from purring, uh, <coughs> injuring the, le pulling the leg back onto the ground, possibly injuring it more than it already was. The other man, while badly injured, was alert and focused. He was a real trooper, said Cabarrus. He told me he was fine, that he had broken his legs before, so don't worry about him. Because of his training, he was able to split, uh, splint the injured man's leg, uh, but Cabarrus didn't want to hurt him any further. Although I knew I was capable of administering a, a splint, I chose to wait for EMTs to arrive, Cabarrus said. Once they arrived on the scene, Cabarrus gave them the details of what he knew of the accident and what measures he had taken to prevent further injury uh, or shock to either victim. Specialist Cabarrus had been a member of the Massachusetts National Guard for four years at the time. Although he holds a field artillery survey MOS, on that evening, every aspect of the National Guard training kicked in. I left the accident scene and was just driving, said Cabarrus. After about 15 minutes had passed, the reality of what had just happened and what I had done hit me. You know, we train and train and train some more uh, and really never get to use what we learn. So I realized that all of the training that I received actually worked and helped me save lives and it made me feel really good. The Massachusetts National Guard uh, and other story, um, we have enduring missions with the Boston Marathon and the 4th of July Esplanade concert every year. You remember in 2013 uh, with the Boston Marathon bomb, we had uh, multiple uh, soldiers who were participating in the Boston Marathon as part of a ruck march. Well, these soldiers happened to be on hand when the first bomb hit and you may have seen it on television, were immediately responding to those who were injured. And like Specialist Cabarrus, they used their additional training, uh, the combat lifesaver training that most of us go through uh, on a regular basis to help save lives on that day. Those are a few examples of how the Massachusetts National Guard soldiers and airmen have been able to respond domestically to help uh, our citizens in need or distress. Uh, multiple stories of uh, overseas deployment uh, skills and achievement and uh, valorous actions uh, are also uh, prevalent. We have an example, um, if I could just move here. In 2011, uh, we had soldiers from the 181 Infantry who were uh, providing security uh, at Camp Phoenix. Camp Phoenix came under attack while they were on watch on, uh, on gate duty, and uh, we had PFC Neves, uh, a young infantryman who uh, was able to, uh, with his small uh, team that was watch, uh, securing that gate, uh, hold back a large force uh, trying to gain access to the base. Uh, over the course of about 15 minutes until uh, reinforcements arrived, they held back this large group uh, sustaining uh, perp uh, injuries resulting in his being awarded the Purple Heart or receiving the Purple Heart and then he was also later awarded the Bronze Star with Valor for his actions that day. To see how Mission Command, where we empower um, our lowest soldier down to know what the end state is or what the intent of the commander is, and how the soldier reacts to get to that end is on them. It's they're empowered to do their job. And uh, Nevis was able to do that uh, over the course of this uh, 15 minutes as we all know, that can be a lifetime 
uh, when you're in a uh, combat situation. And uh, his actions that day uh, uh, saved lives, saved uh, the lives of his teammates, and uh, kept the security of the base uh, so that um, they weren't able to get on to and do whatever harm they wanted to bring on the base. So not every veteran performs great acts, as in the stories I've spoken to this morning. But every veteran is truly a hero in their own right, simply because they serve. There is nothing stronger than the heart of a volunteer, said General James Doolittle. Members of the National Guard are the strongest of hearts, and their service to their country and state is a debt we will forever pay. Every veteran needs the support of friends, families, and employers and communities. Without your support, they could not do what they do. For that, we are extremely grateful for your service to our veterans. I ask that we all continue appreciating our veterans and currently serving guardsmen and women. They are amongst the best of our society, so never consider their time away performing duty as a distractor to the greater benefits that they provide their employers. Because in the long run, these times away during drill weekends, annual training, and schools only strengthen them as an employee. Thank you to all the veterans on this day of celebration, and thank you for all who support us unconditionally. On behalf of our Adjutant General, Major General Keefe, we wish you a peaceful and prosperous Veterans Day and continued health, joy, and happiness throughout the holidays. Thank you, and I believe we have a question and answer session. Questions from the Boy Scouts? <laughs> I expect one. Someone come up with one. Go ahead, Howard. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, service, uh, 2003-2004? Okay. Uh, what, what you faced, what your team faced, and so forth. Okay, so we were activated uh, in 2003, uh, shortly after the uh, nightclub fire in Rhode Island. It was in February of 2003. And uh, we immediately went down to Fort Dix, New Jersey for training. And at that time, they really didn't uh, have the whole deployment preparations uh, synchronized or efficient. So we were there for a good three months, where nowadays it takes about a month to go through a MOB station. So uh, I got to enjoy New Jersey in uh, February, March, and April. Uh, but then uh, we deployed. Uh, we arrived in Kuwait originally, and then we uh, uh, motor moved up to uh, Talil Air Base, uh, which is about halfway between Baghdad and the border between Kuwait and Iraq. And uh, when I arrived there, my initial charge, I, I was a supply management officer, so my original charge was to go around the country of uh, Iraq and Kuwait to identify uh, commercial vendors where we could get uh, uh, repair parts. Uh, because if you have a, uh, a Cummings engine, and that's usually commercial off the shelf, so you can get a Cummings engine part from multiple different sources. So I was traveling around quite a bit, setting up all these local vendors, and I got to fly around a lot too, which was a lot of fun. And then uh, in around uh, July time frame, a uh, helicopter got shot down by an RPG, and I went to my battalion commander and I said, I think we got enough uh, local vendors. <laughs> so he said, great, perfect timing. Now I want you to take charge of our water operations. So that tur turned out to be quite the challenge because we're in the desert, and we had about 300,000 gallons of uh, water required every day to operate Talil Air Base and we use reverse osmosis water purification units to do that. So uh, we had eight of these units, uh, each one capable of producing about 60,000 gallons a day, so more than enough capability, but the problem was the raw water source was uh, so uh, bad that our machines kept breaking down to the point where when he 
volunteered me to take charge of the water operation, only two of them were working. Well, that's 120 k a day, and that's a lot less than the requirement of 300000 So uh, I immediately worked on uh, uh, maintenance of PMCS, preventive maintenance, uh, uh, checks and services, uh, so we could get these things operational. And also I worked on the bigger problem of that raw water source that was not so turbid and uh, clogging up our machines. So I worked with some engineers from Wisconsin to build a giant hole in the ground. We called it, well, when it finally filled, we called it Lake Michigan. Uh, <laughs> so uh, they dug the giant hole. I worked a series of step canals from the Euphrates uh, that would gravity feed this giant uh, hole in the ground. And uh, eventually we were able to fill it and that allowed us to have a better raw water source and then eventually our rope views weren't clogging as quickly as they were and we were able to sustain our water requirements at Toledo Air Base. And right when we were ready to uh, redeploy, the local contractors came in with all this high-tech high equipment and they had it so easy and I was so <laughs> jealous that uh, I, we had to work so hard to set these folks up to just take over and have a turnkey operation where they had uh, a sustainable water source. Um, so that's the gist of uh, my deployment in Iraq. Yes. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I think one of the roles of the National Guard that's frequently overlooked uh, is to uh, give an example of my dad who joined the National Guard at the time they were training on horseback at the armory. Yep. And he thought that was a novel opportunity. What he didn't realize that was in the 1930s, what would happen in 1941. Uh, at the beginning of World War II, he was 37 years old, had two children, had no obligation to go to active duty, but he chose to. Uh, went to Fort Sill and was commissioned. <coughs> and uh, spent two and a half years in the European theater, including being in the Battle of the Bulge. He uh, was liberated at the end of the war as part of the unit that liberated one of the concentration camps, he received the Purple Heart. All this as a National Guard, nationalized officer uh, and, and an enlisted man. And I think that you might expound a little bit more on that, just not the deployment of Guard as Guard, but in the nationalized services. Because it, it, he, like so many men of valor that did this, he never talked about it. I wish now that I had, had the opportunity. I was a, I was a Vietnam era Coast Guard veteran, uh, but we never talked about it. Uh, I asked a couple of probing questions and just brushed it off. He'd seen too much horror. I heard from another veteran friend of his. Uh, and, uh, uh, he was on a half track and uh, under enemy fire, saw one of his best friends from home and back standing three feet away from him. And it changed him, obviously. Uh, they didn't have the fancy term PSP, but it affected National Guard members as much as regular army and any other regular service. So just a little comment on it. That role, please. Thank you for sharing that story, and uh, I certainly do appreciate the the services that are provided to our veterans uh, today, as opposed to what many of you uh, experienced when you came home. And uh, it's it, it it was a shame how uh, our society treated a lot of our veterans, especially during Vietnam, upon the return. Uh, but I am grateful that. We've done that. We've gotten this right. At least now, our society is recognizing the value and uh, contributions that our veterans make, and uh, are doing something about it. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, with regards to the operational National Guard, um, prior to 2001, uh, we generally did our two weeks uh, during the summer and uh, one weekend a month, and it was maybe an advanced Boy Scouts. <laughs> I, I, joke, I jokingly say that, but uh, it, it certainly was not as, uh, it was a strategic reserve mission. So uh, the expectation was that there was going to be a long train up, 
uh, to get us more combat ready uh, to, to deploy overseas and do our mission. Uh, over the last 20 years, we've seen, however, that we have deployed more, uh, a lot more frequently, and the majority of our National Guardsmen, our veterans, have served overseas, and, uh, and that is because we're now an operational force. And uh, to achieve that, uh, we've, our, our training and readiness requirements are that much greater. Uh, we serve with purpose, and uh, we, we have to find efficiencies. Uh, with regards to our training uh, so that we get the most bang for the buck and return on investment of uh, using uh, our national treasure to, to, to fund uh, our training so that we are as ready and, and able when we're called to duty. So uh, with the uh, large number of veterans in our force, experienced deployment, um, our uh, current force is um, more relevant to the active army. Uh, in the past, prior to 2001, the active army, uh, they really didn't look at the National Guard as being equals. And I, and I know today that that has changed. Uh, we are uh, looked at as uh, equal in capability and readiness and ability to do the job. And additionally, in some cases, even more so, because we also are dual purpose citizens, or we're, we're citizen soldiers. So we have additional skills that we bring to the fight uh, that the active duty counterparts may not have. So uh, thank you for your question. So I don't have my glasses on, but what's your rank? I'm just a scout. Just a scout. Well, scout. let me tell you something, that it's not just anything. You're wearing a uniform, you're part of a team, and you're wearing your uniform proudly, I can see that. And uh, with time and your contributions as you're doing this morning, you're gonna pass through the ranks. Just keep at it and have a goal and, and challenge yourself. And uh, don't have a regret like I did. Because I learned at an early age uh, not to live with regret. So drive through all those challenges you might encounter in the coming years and get that eagle. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I really thank the the colonel for you know, these insights that he's provided us today, including some of the more personal stories and stories of what people are doing in our own community. Um, I, I did want to say to the Colonel that I want the basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey, so I feel your pain. Uh, it also happened to be during the winter, and while they don't get as much snow down there, uh, they get a lot of freezing rain and stuff that makes it even worse. You kind of wish you were back in Massachusetts. Uh, one gentleman, I think, raised the uh, point of, you know, soldiers returning from war. Uh, at our Rotary Club, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a, a gentleman, I can only remember his first name, it's Charlie, and I can't for the life of me remember his last name. He's an author. And he wrote a book called My Father's War. And it's, it's about the World War II veterans returning uh, home after, you know, doing their duty in Europe and Asia. And th there's one difference, substantial difference, in their return home versus veterans from Vietnam and fo going forward. And that is that they had time on the troop transports, okay, to spend time to talk about their experiences with their fellow soldiers. And you know, there's some belief that that might have helped them kind of decompress more than what happens today. You're in the Middle East, you're in Vietnam, in 24 hours you've gone from a war scene to home. And so I think it's an interesting book. I'm not trying to sell this book, but I think the message is interesting. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say, and Kate 
Hogan, our representative, is no longer here. She works on public health and talked about it. Uh, I do use the VA uh, hospital. I go to Brockton. Um, and I know from at least one gentleman in the, in the uh, audience here who's used the VA substantially. Uh, I can only say that, at least in Massachusetts, from what I've seen, uh, the health care we get at the VA is very, very good. Uh, from the time you go to the hospital to be greeted warmly, and we are, uh, and there's many, many medical uh, facilities and capabilities there, so um, I'd, I'd say that uh, it was, uh, it's, it's better than you read in the press, uh, at least in Massachusetts. I can't speak about Arizona and other places that are infamous for things that have happened. And I do want to, uh, apologize for the uh, error on, on Colonel Hill, his rank. Uh, uh, the one thing I will say, that I didn't, unfortunately didn't see it in the write-up anywhere, but what I will say is that a colonel in my book, being you know, a, an enlisted man, is a colonel. Now, I served at the Fifth Corps headquarters in uh, Frankfurt, Germany. And being a Spec 5, I mean, I can tell you that's on the bottom of who's at that place. Um, we could have spent in the corridors of the building, it's, it's actually a building that Eisenhower saved, uh, didn't allow it to be bombed because he knew that was going to be his headquarters building, and so like a five-story building. And, um, you know, a simple enlisted man like me literally would have to walk down the hallway uh, like that. Uh, we always saluted colonels and higher. <laughs> so, Colonel, uh, congratulations and thank you. Uh, so. With that, uh, we will uh, go forward to our closing of our program today, and it's been, I think, an excellent one. Um, we'll start with a benediction uh, from our, our Reverend Landrum, and uh, then following that, uh, the Scouts will uh, take the flag uh, in the flag's closing ceremony. And I'd like to invite, following that, all veterans to come forward, uh, including certainly the Colonel and all of us to, to get our photograph taken. So again, thank you to all the veterans. Thank you to the friends, family, Rotarians, Scouts, they're all here. Thank you. Well, for a minute I thought we were going to be done early and I was gonna have time to give you a sermon, but... <laughs> Um, I just want to say thank you to the Rotary Club for coming here and using our facilities. It's a delight to have you here, um, as you have been here on, for this event for many years. And we're glad to welcome you into our house today. Spirit of life, may the freedom, peace, joy, and love, and the respect and honor that we have shared this day go with us as we leave. May today be a day full of blessings and gratitude for those who have served and those who continue to serve. May we go forth with appreciation always. Amen. Scouts, I think the honor is yours.
Yeah, it's a rebate. 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 It's